I have 3D printed a heck of a lot of things here on Maker's Muse over the past few years. But have you ever wondered what happens to those projects after I'm done with them? Well, I was recently tidying up the studio and I came across this. This box right here represents over seven years of projects here on Maker's Muse. And in this video, we'll talk about what went well, what didn't go so well, and things I'd like to improve for future. Let's get started. And we'll start with this unassuming object. This is my Red Bull car can holder that I designed way back in 2014 when the channel was just getting started. I designed this to fit those slim Red Bull cans in my car's cup holder because as I was driving, they were flying all over the place and falling over. And it was a simple tutorial I did using Onshape, which at the time was the only real powerful free CAD program that was around. And I designed it, did a tutorial, and this went on to be used for hundreds of hundreds of days after that. And it still, to this day, lives in the car. It looks a little bit worse for wear, but keep in mind this was ABS printed on my UP Mini. And it's actually not as discolored or damaged as you'd think because it's, it's endured several Australian summers and ABS is quite UV sensitive. But because it's in the car, it wasn't exposed to the UV rays directly. And I think that's why it's still fairly white. It is, however, very dirty because obviously it's had drinks and things spilt on it over the years. And uh, because of the layers of 3D prints, it really gets into it and you can't really clean it. However, I don't really drink energy drinks anymore, so I haven't used this for quite a while. But yeah, from humble objects like this little 3D print, this channel got its start. And I'm very thankful to all of you guys who support the channel back then for tutorials like this because I really did enjoy bringing them to you and it was the basis of what the channel became today. Next up we have a maker coin, but not just any maker coin, we have this huge maker coin with a 3D lattice infill. This was designed back in 2016 and at the time a 3D lattice infill was actually kind of very difficult to do. <laughs> I actually had to use Mesh Mixer and hack it slightly to create a 3D infill that was then combined with the outer shell of a maker coin. This is printed on the Craftbot Plus when I was still working out of my parents' basement and it actually turned out really, really well. I remember this print took like over 20 hours to print. I wasn't printing big things back then very often, but it came out way better than I expected. Uh, it's printed from a translucent PLA, which to this day is one of the nicer uh, reds I've ever used for printing decorative objects like this. And uh, fun fact, I took this to a mini maker fair at the Powerhouse Museum and a kid tried to steal it. He's, uh, his friend dobbed him in, but yeah, he was trying to make off with this maker coin, which I would have been very sad about because it's very special to me. And yeah, if you guys don't know where maker coins come from, they are originally an idea I came up with to just make filament swatches of various filament samples I was sent because I didn't used to get sent rolls. I'd be sent just little small amounts of filament and I'd make the maker coin swatches to keep a record of that. And it became like the go-to design that people would do as a rite of passage into 3D printing. The first thing you design would be a maker coin. And I've done several tutorials on that. If you're interested, you can find them in the video links below. They're a fantastic model to get started in 3D design and 3D printing. Next up, we have this arcade button macro keyboard, which was one of my first forays into programming. It's got a microcontroller in it. I program using Arduino. And I will not lie to you guys, I hate programming. I find it really unnatural and uh, tedious. I don't enjoy the process. So anytime I use programming on the channel, I usually get code that exists and modify it to suit my needs. I don't write it from scratch. It's just not what I do. I'm good at certain other things. I'm just not good at uh, coding. But a lot of you guys are, which is awesome. So a lot of you took this design and made your own versions of it, which is really, really cool to see. Uh, it's a really, really fun project to get into. And like I said, a lot of people took this design and then pushed it further with their own knowledge in coding and design. And again, you can find it linked in the video description. Next up, we have one of my favorite mechanisms ever. This is a two-way to one-way mechanism, which means when you rotate the handle, no matter which way you rotate it, the output gear will always spin one direction. You cannot make it spin backwards. I first came across this mechanism in the Engineer's Illustrated Thesaurus, which is an old book cataloging different interesting mechanisms. When I saw it, I just thought I just had to try to make it. And that project was tons of fun. A lot of people found it really interesting. But in the original, I used a ratchet and pull system to uh, ratchet the gears so they couldn't go backwards. But then later on, I investigated roller bearings and 3D printing a one-way uh, sprag clutch effectively, which uses these rollers and a little 
uh, ramp that jams them up in one direction only. And I incorporated them back in to this two-way to one-way mechanism. So instead of having that really loud ratchet sound that the original had, it's a lot quieter, but works just as well. And it's fully 3D printed except for one bolt at the front, which locks on that output gear. So if you find mechanisms interesting, then I highly recommend checking out this two-way to one-way mechanism. Again, the video is gonna be below, but it's ingenious. And yeah, people came up with some crazy mechanisms way back in the day. Next up, we have the first print responsible for my viral fame on YouTube. Uh, it was completely unexpected, but overnight, the video for the Geneva mechanism hit a few hundred thousand views. I was at a friend's house, I woke up and I'm like, Wow, that's a lot of comments. Because <laughs> uh, at the time, uh, 3D printing was kind of unknown. But the thing about this mechanism is it's really fascinating. And I think that bridged the gap between people who weren't interested directly in 3D printing, but were interested in just interesting mechanisms and, and engineering to then perhaps consider 3D printing as something they might want to check out to make such things. It's an interesting intermittent motion mechanism. So this mechanism, as you rotate the output shaft, it flicks around really quickly and there's a dwell period between each rotation. And it was used in early film projectors as well as CNC machine turrets and all sorts of things. This is a very special print to me because it represents a big shift in the channel's direction from just doing specific 3D printing things to actually showing cool stuff that 3D printers can do, which then gets people into 3D printing. So if that was you, uh, let me know in the comments below uh, what video got you interested in 3D printing. It doesn't have to be one of mine. Uh, I'd love to hear what video you want or concept you want to come across that got you interested in 3D printing, whether it was like a figurine or a mechanism or a cool project. They thought, wow, uh, if I had a 3D printer, I could do something cool like that too. I'd love to hear what you have to say down below. But not every project I did on the channel worked out as well as I hoped. So these are a few that didn't quite work out after the video. This is my synth wave inspired headphones holder design. The idea of this is it held headphones and it has LEDs in the back and it lights up and looks awesome. It did look awesome, but then they all fell off the wall. <laughs> uh, this was designed to use those command strips or whatever they're called, where they've got a, uh, it's like essentially double-sided tape, but it's designed to be wall safe and not rip your paint off. But no matter what I did, I couldn't get it to stick well enough to the PLA. It would always eventually fall away. And I have some pretty hefty headphones, like these are heavy and they would eventually just fall off the wall and I'd find them crash into the ground. And because they're all joined together like this, one would pull the other off and they'd all go and just collapse off the wall. So to address that, I could redesign this to have bolts into a back panel, which is then held to the wall with command strips much more securely, or I could also screw into the wall. But I'll be honest, in the end, I only really use one pair of headphones at a time. So I just went with a 3D printed headphones holder, which is again, is a fantastic first 3D design to get into the, uh, the concept of 3D modeling and 3D printing. You make it perfectly suited to your pair of headphones and your desk. And in this case, this one just slides in place, holds my headphones, and it works great and I've been using this ever since. And talking about desks, I did do an entire desk overhaul with 3D printed components and these wings that held my speakers. And this is one such wing. This is heavy duty steel, it's six millimeters thick steel and this is all that's left of that desk. Unfortunately, with that design, I had a few problems that were impossible to overcome. The first issue was the desk was just garbage quality. It was from Kmart, it cost like $25 and the chipboard interior, once I put these wings and the, and the speakers on, would bow the desk. It was really, really poor quality and it just wasn't able to withstand the extra weight. And then secondly, I had a really big bass trap issue. So where the speakers were, there was a corner of the room and that caused a reverberation of bass frequencies. And it was really annoying and difficult to overcome. So in the end, I had to basically scrap that desk. I replaced it with a sit and stand desk, which has been very good for me. I can stand while I edit. Then I actually got some freestanding speaker holders, which means I can position them in the room with bass traps in the corner to stop that reverberation. And it's been a lot better since then. It's not perfect, but yeah, this design unfortunately was flawed from the start but it did look pretty dang cool, I must admit. Every Easter I tried to design an Easter themed model and this was no exception. This is the torture egg. <laughs> so cool because although it prints like this, it's actually three separate parts and they all independently rotate. The reason this is so incredibly difficult to print is because each spoke is just precariously supported by the layer before it and there's three of them. They all have to be printed in such a way that there's enough clearance that they are all free spin once the print's complete. 
It's incredibly challenging and I highly recommend checking it out because it's a free file and you can find it below. And if you're game, you can print it at half size and that makes it even more difficult, but it's fully possible on FGM 3D prints and even possible on resin 3D prints if you manage to get the uncured resin free from between the parts before you cure it because otherwise it just glues together. I've been a big fan of making puzzles on the channel for some time because again, that's a really great way of getting people interested in 3D printing. And this is the Fusion Overload puzzle. And I branded it as my most difficult puzzle ever. And I stand by that, it's pretty hard to solve. I would describe it as an inverted labyrinth puzzle because with those labyrinth puzzle, you have a tooth which engages with a hidden maze inside and you have to unscrew the top by guiding that tooth around the hidden maze. Instead of having a tooth though, this puzzle uses a ball bearing, which once you put into the maze, disappears. And you just have to listen and feel for where it may be until you can eventually unscrew it. Now, although I found this puzzle incredibly difficult, a lot of you guys who are much more experienced solving puzzles said it wasn't that difficult. Uh, but what I really want to change for us version two is a way to reset it properly. Because currently the only way to reset it is to just solve the puzzle in reverse. And I've had a few ideas, but I think if I made a one way gate with the ball bearing to actually slide through and then back down to the reset position, uh, so you can put it in place, screw it down and then reset it with one uh, motion, that would be a good way to go about it. I haven't quite thought about how I'd do that simply, but I think that'd be the best way to go. You can also solve this with a magnet, which I did show in the video. It makes it a little bit easier, but yeah, in terms of complexity, this can be made way harder by putting a more complicated maze in with more false ends, more false promises where you think you're getting it right to the end and then, you know, it's, it's impossible. A few people said they should make it uh, have a position which makes it impossible to solve, like it gets stuck. I don't really agree with that. It should always be solvable, but I can definitely make it a lot harder. So I may, may revisit this in a version two to make it diabolically difficult for you guys that really like a challenge. If you do the channel, you might not recognize this cube, but it caused so many people, so many headaches. This is a puzzle cube that I released on the channel, but I released it like this. The prints are four parts without support material and the goal is to assemble it again, where they slide into place using a complex twisting motion in a specific order to then create a solid object. And the really cool thing about this design is it could be used for any solid object. Uh, in Fusion, I actually created a sweep with a slight twist to it with a somewhat dovetail shape, but it was irregular. That would sweep through the, through the part through different orientations to create these sharp looking alien-esque objects that have to go together in a certain way and uh, if you want to print this again, there'll be description, links in the description. I'm not gonna show you how it works, but it does stump a lot of people. Some people get it really quickly. They sort of look at it and figure out how it works, but it does stump a lot of people. So for Christmas, if you want something fun to keep the kids entertained, uh, this is a really good design to go with. And I may well revisit this again in future to make it even more complicated to reassemble. I find locks and locking mechanisms incredibly fascinating as well. I've done several recreations of locks such as a really old Assyrian lock and this right here, which is a double lock design based off a Russian design that I came across online that was used in like Soviet era block buildings where they had to have these locks that would survive incredibly brutal winters that would normally freeze up regular tumblers and regular locks. It has this interesting key, it's really strange looking, that engages with these matching paths in the bolts that then will open it up like so. There's actually a myth that's going around about this design of lock that you can open it with a carrot. So you just literally get a carrot, shove it into the lock, and because the carrot's soft-ish, but still fairly resilient, it'll engage with those cutouts and then basically cut itself into the key and open the bolts. Now I did try that in the video and it didn't work out, it just made a mess. But maybe with the real locks that are made out of metal, it might work, uh, it may not. But if you're coming up with an interesting lock box for your next Dungeons and Dragons campaign or something interesting for Christmas, then check out that mechanism because it can be re reused for a lot of different things. It's essentially turning uh, the motion perpendicular like that. And the key has to mate with those paths in the bolt or it won't work at all. So definitely go check that out if you're interested. And then finally, we have this. This is my gigantic PC fan.
I built this fan because Corsair made an April Fool's joke talking about building a humongous PC cooling fan and I wanted one for myself because what they showed wasn't real. And I made mine the world's most powerful PC fan because I put a really powerful brushless outrunner motor in it and it was terrifyingly fast. The only issue is it had various flaws in it and a lot of you guys wanted to download and print one for yourself but I never released the files because, well, it wasn't really recreatable. So since then, I have tried to solve that by making it more of a desk piece where it would spin slowly. So I've replaced the powerful brushless motor inside with a much slower geared motor that will slowly rotate it around. But I'm having tolerance issues. So because this fan hub is made up of several blades printed and then assembled, it's not quite perfectly concentric. So it actually does rub and in the video, uh, it was actually rubbing quite a bit, but the motor just overcame it to the point where the 3D printed gear actually shredded itself and failed. And that's what died in the video when I did a full speed test, the gear actually just exploded. <laughs> Apart from that, everything else is good, but I do need to redesign it with better tolerances. Uh, so maybe a better way to assemble the hub so it's more accurate. And I need a motor that's quiet. The motor I chose is really loud, surprisingly, because what I really like is for it to just spin really slowly and look cool in the background of my videos. And I know a lot of you guys would want to recreate that. So when I do finally make it viable, I will release the files. And I think I'm gonna leave it here. I have designed so much more than I've talked about in this video over the past like seven years of making content here on YouTube. Some of the projects worked out great and some of them didn't. But that's just part of the learning experience. And every time I make something, whether it works well or it doesn't, I learn something new. And it's worth keeping in mind that a lot of the things I show were iterative. Like the final designs I show and I have available for download, they're usually like the third or fourth iteration of that original concept. I'll draw something, then I'll pr try to print a prototype. Prototype won't quite work. I'll go back to the drawing board and so on and so forth. I don't just come up with designs perfect right off the bat. No one does. If they tell you they do, they're lying. <laughs> Everything's iterative and I highly encourage you to try making something cool and then 3D printing it to bring your ideas to life. If you enjoyed this video here on Makers Muse, make sure you're subscribing for cool future content and I look forward to seeing you again very shortly. Catch you later guys. Bye.